Hello everybody, my name is Ensign Ricky, and welcome back to The Lower Decks. In today's video, I'm going to be kicking off my new series called Understanding Trek. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. and it's likely one of us will be killed. The landing party will consist of myself, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and Ensign Ricky. Ah, oh, crap. All right. I wanted to start this video series because A, I love Star Trek, and B, I love not only what goes on on the screen, but I love the immense story behind Star Trek as well. Star Trek itself is quite a story, not only on the screen, but also behind it. When I started this channel, my initial goal was not only to address everything we see on the screen, but also the people behind the scenes that made everything happen. Not many people realize that what goes on behind the scenes directly influences what we see on the screen. Also, not many people on YouTube make videos about this topic, and I intend to change that. Today I'm going to cover the Star Trek timeline from TOS all the way up to the creation of the animated series. The reason why is because when Gene Roddenberry was alive, he heavily influenced the production of these two series. Roddenberry would pass away in 1991 during the filming and production of the TNG episode, Hero Worship. This was in the show's fifth season. So with that being said, I'm going to be naming this video The Roddenberry Years Part 1. In Part 2, I'm going to be covering the animated series up into the next generation until Gene Roddenberry died. In today's video, I'm going to be discussing the upper hierarchy behind the original series. So we are going to be focusing on the creator and producers behind Star Trek. In future videos, I plan to work on other topics such as the production of Star Trek or the people behind the technology of Star Trek. But today, I'm going to give you some examples of some of the things that went on behind the scenes and the reasons why I give shows like Star Trek Discovery the benefit of the doubt. So for a quick explanation about what I'm going to be discussing. An executive producer, or showrunner, is basically the guy who controls everything. He's the guy that makes the final decisions, he's the guy that talks to the studio executives, he's the guy that plans out the show, the characters, um, they are pretty much in control of running the show. So with this knowledge in hand, let's move back into the Star Trek universe. So as you probably know if you're watching this video, Star Trek was created by Gene Roddenberry, also known as the Great Bird of the Galaxy, in 1966. So what better place to start? Gene Roddenberry was an executive producer, writer, author, retired military lieutenant, and former police sergeant of the LAPD. He was born in El Paso, Texas to Edward and Caroline Roddenberry. As soon as Gene was born, the Roddenberry family would move to Los Angeles. Gene's father was a World War I veteran and his mother was a devout Baptist. Shortly after school, however, Gene would turn his interest into aeronautical engineering he would apply and receive his pilot's license, and then he would volunteer for the United States Army Air Corps. The military would give him the rank of flying cadet. However, after this, World War II broke out and Gene was ordered to the South Pacific. He gained the rank of second lieutenant and flew in 89 missions against enemy strongholds. But it was here amidst all the fighting that Roddenberry learned how to write. He would sell short stories to magazines and publications. At the end of the war, Gene was decorated with the Distinguished Flying Cross and an Air Medal. He then got a job working as a commercial pilot for Pan American, but he would still go to Columbia University and study literature on the side. It was also here where Gene met and married his first wife. Roddenberry continued to fly into the creation of television. It's said that as soon as he seen television, Gene already estimated the future of the medium and knew that they were going to need writers. Gene then left his job at Pan American and moved to Hollywood to pursue a career as a writer. On a side note, however, part of the reason was also because Gene had crashed a plane as one of seven survivors that survived the crash. This is not the only time, though, that Gene would crash a plane and survive. In World War II, he also crashed a plane before it took off and survived that. So Gene Roddenberry is one lucky man. Some people claim that when Gene crashed the Pan American flight, he saw this as a sign to change profession and get out of the flying business. However, when Gene arrived in Hollywood, television was still in its very fundamental stages and there was almost no openings for inexperienced writers. So Gene got a job at the Los Angeles Police Department. 
While working at the police department, Gene continued to sell scripts to television productions. He would eventually work his way to sergeant. Having now established himself as a writer while working at the LAPD, Gene then turned his badge in in 1956 and then began to open his own production company. This, however, was completely against the wishes of his wife, whom he had now had two daughters with. This also eventually led to their divorce. Naming his new company the Norway Corporation, Gene Roddenberry wanted to start making shows of his own. To handle all the legal aspects of this new company, Roddenberry hired young attorney Leonard Mazelish. Mazelish would remain Roddenberry's attorney until his death in 1991. Unbeknownst to everyone at the time, Leonard Mazelish would become a highly questionable figure during the production of The Next Generation, and I will be breaking down that in the next video, part two of the Roddenberry years. To handle all the finances of this new corporation, Gene Roddenberry hired young accountant Mort Kessler. Mort Kessler had just graduated from school. Kessler would not only oversee Roddenberry's business finances, but his personal finances as well. In fact, Kessler would provide services to Roddenberry's family even after Gene's death in 1991. He would go even as far as to provide services to Gene's son, Rod Roddenberry, up until when he retired. Needless to say, the people that stood by Gene Roddenberry and were on his side were very loyal and very much on his side. Other than Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry worked on such projects as The Lieutenant, Have Gun, Will Travel, Boots and Saddles, West Point, Whiplash, The Lawbreakers, and Pretty Maids, all in a row. Gene's first production would be The Lieutenant, which featured Gary Lockwood and many actors that would become the original Star Trek alumni. Unfortunately, after one season, The Lieutenant was canceled and Gene Roddenberry had started coming up with the premise for Star Trek. Gene then reached out to many studios to help with production of the show, but he was largely unsuccessful. But then, Desilu Studios, who was owned by Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, decided to pick up the pilot. Desilu Studios itself had been very successful with its run of comedies, especially from I Love Lucy, but it was in search of drama shows to fill out its roster. In addition to producing television shows, Desilu Studios hosted three huge lots for production. They would regularly rent out these lots to people such as Bing Crosby for their productions. But it was here that Star Trek officially started. Since Roddenberry was the main creator of the show, he would become the show's first executive producer. With help from Desilu Studios head executive Herbert Solo, Roddenberry would start hiring many people from the industry to craft his vision for Star Trek. Many people credit Herbert Solo as a major figure in both the production and promotion of Star Trek. Most studio executives at that point were exactly just that, executives, and they would only handle their upper management responsibilities. It was almost unheard of that a studio executive, especially a head studio executive, would go out of his way to help with the production of a show especially in the way that Herbert Solo did for Star Trek. Many people not only hail him as a hero, but also as an amazing person to work for. So, with Gene Roddenberry and Herbert Solo at the helm, staffing and production in Star Trek would begin. So let's move on, shall we, into Star Trek The Original Series, otherwise known as TOS. Star Trek The Original Series aired on television on September 8, 1966. So, we're going to start at Season 1. For help in writing science fiction, Gene Roddenberry turned to his friend, Samuel A. Peoples, who was a prolific Western writer at the time, but had a deep love for science fiction. Peoples wrote many Western-themed shows, such as The Rifleman, The Tall Man, Frontier Circus, and Have Gun, Will Travel. Roddenberry and Peoples would become fast friends while working on Have Gun, Will Travel. Peoples was actually responsible for the quote, Wagon Train to the Stars, that Gene Roddenberry coined later to use to describe Star Trek. He was also responsible for introducing Gene Roddenberry to many great works of science fiction. Peoples also gave Gene Roddenberry a list of writers that he thought would be good for writing Star Trek. He would continue to work with Roddenberry as a consultant for Star Trek. He would also help Gene Roddenberry script Star Trek's first and second pilot, The Cage and Where No Man Has Gone Before. After leaving Star Trek, Peoples would eventually return later on to help Dorothy D.C. Fontana script the first episode of Star Trek's animated series, Beyond the Furthest Star. Also, Peoples wrote a story outline called The Worlds That Never Were, 
which eventually turned into Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Even though he's not credited for it, Peoples also created the character of Savick from the movie. To help produce the new series, Gene Roddenberry and Herbert Solo began to hire staff for Star Trek's pilot, The Cage. Their first aim was to hire on Robert Justman as an associate producer, but Justman declined the offer at the time. Instead, he recommended Bob Haskin. Haskin was a close friend of Robert Justman's. Justman added that he felt that he didn't have the skills necessary to create the pilot. But this would all fall through as Gene Roddenberry and Byron Haskin would often clash heads on the project, leading to many arguments in its creation. After the pilot didn't meet with the expectations that NBC had hoped, NBC granted Roddenberry the rare second chance for a second pilot. Like I said, lucky man. So wanting to do things right this time, Gene Roddenberry and Herb Solo opted for Robert Justman, but this time he agreed, and they hired him on as the associate producer for Star Trek. Justman would remain a producer on Star Trek's original series all the way into the show's third season. He would leave Star Trek claiming that he was too exhausted to continue on the show. By the 15th episode of the show's third season, Robert Justman would leave. Their next acquisition would be veteran writer John D.F. Black. Black would win a Writers Guild Award for his series at the time, Mr. Novak. Gene Roddenberry would approach him at the ceremony and invite him back to his house, claiming that he was throwing a party for all the winners. Black would accept Gene's offer and attend the party at Gene's house. Later on during that night, Gene would approach Black and offer him the position to work on Star Trek. Gene wanted Black to work with all the writers that were sending their scripts in for the show. He was to go over the scripts that were purchased for the show and work with the writers into working them into teleplays. A teleplay is taking a script and formatting it for television. Black eventually accepted Gene's offer and was hired on to Star Trek as the executive story editor and co-producer. Black's secretary at the time, Mary Stowell, would help with the production process, along with Dorothy D.C. Fontana, who was Gene Roddenberry's secretary at the time. Black would end up marrying his secretary, and Dorothy D.C. Fontana would end up becoming a full-fledged writer. So with Roddenberry, Solo, Justman, and Black, Star Trek's upper management was in place. Gene had already written out 10 or so scripts. These stories, with the addition of a couple more purchased scripts, became the first half of season one in Star Trek The Original Series. During this time, the production crew, who was headed by Walter Matthew Jeffries, otherwise known as Matt Jeffries, whom I will get into in another video, had many amazing challenges. None of the special effects in Star Trek had even been conceived of, much less put on a television screen. Matt Jeffries and his crew were amongst the first people in Hollywood to create the science behind these techniques and apply them to TV. I do plan to do another video of Understanding Trek, spotlighting the creation of Trek and the people behind it. On a side note, the Jeffries tubes in Star Trek, or the tunnels between the decks that the crew uses to go back and forth, are named after Walter and Matt Jeffries. But let's get back to the producers. As production commenced, Gene Roddenberry asked John D.F. Black to reach out to other science fiction writers to see if they would like to write for the show. He knew at the time that science fiction writers were very, very hard to find. And some of the more well-known and respected writers don't appreciate their work being touched or messed with. Gene Roddenberry wholeheartedly agreed with this and said he wouldn't touch any scripts or rewrite anybody. So John D.F. Black would start interviewing writers and start bringing in scripts. He attracted some of the most brilliant and well-respected writers of that era, such as Harlan Ellison and Theodore Sturgeon. It was also almost around this time that John D.F. Black created Kirk's dialogue that he says at the beginning of each show. Space, the final frontier. Black would work extensively with these writers to turn their scripts into teleplays, but that's when the problems started to arise. Roddenberry would indeed start rewriting every script that came in, and he would do so without any notification or warning, even after he promised Black that he wouldn't. This led to many arguments between John D. Black and Gene Roddenberry. The authors were getting furious because Gene Roddenberry would sometimes rewrite their script to the point it wasn't even their story anymore. Black would continue to work with Roddenberry even through the arguments and empty promises. And then one day, Gene Roddenberry would rewrite John Black's script for The Naked Time, which was already finished. And he would do it in his normal Roddenberry fashion, 
No warnings, no notes, no discussions, just rewrite the script. Of course, this ended up infuriating John D.F. Black, and he eventually left the show in the middle of season one. Black would return, though, later on down the line in The Next Generation with his script for the episode The Naked Now, as well as a little work on the episode Justice. These, however, would be his final contributions to Star Trek. With Black now gone in the middle of the first season, Roddenberry and Justman were now in charge of full production of the show. This could be considered as a serious blow to the series, but what actually happened next changed Star Trek forever and then solidified its legacy for 50 plus years to come. Not too long after Black left the show, Gene Roddenberry would hire Gene Alcoon, and that would change Star Trek forever. When Gene Alcoon would come aboard, he would become the show's producer, and Gene Roddenberry would step back and take a break due to exhaustion. After his short break, Gene Roddenberry would step back into an executive producer position and only act as a supervisor. With Gene Alcoon in charge, he would take the show to new heights among fans and critics. He was also responsible for forming the very basic fundamentals of the Trek we see now. So let's take a minute and give tribute to the man who brought us the UFP, Klingons, and Tribbles. One of the most unspoken and undercredited heroes in Star Trek's complicated yet vibrant history, Gene L. Kuhn. Gene L. Kuhn was a prolific writer and producer. Kuhn was revered for his progressive thinking, his honesty, and his open-mindedness. He also had a talent which he would call automatic writing. Automatic writing is a term that Kuhn used to describe how he wrote. Kuhn claimed that he can put himself into a trance-like state which would allow him to automatically write for up to as many as 10 hours a day. Many people claimed that Kuhn could take a script and turn it around faster than anyone in the business. Not only was Kuhn fast, but the quality of his work was astounding. And it didn't even matter the genre, Kuhn could write scripts from westerns, dramas, crime stories, even comedies. Anything that anybody could send his way, Kuhn could do it and turn it around faster than anybody in the business. Gene Kuhn had quite the reputation before he even started working on Star Trek. Kuhn would continue to work on Star Trek until halfway through its second season. He would deeply expand all the characters on the series, and then he would also form the basis of what we now know as the Prime Directive and the United Federation of Planets. Many critics agree that when Star Trek was under the guidance of Gene L. Kuhn, that the show produced its best episodes. Kuhn would work tirelessly, knocking out script after script for Star Trek. Many writers at the time respected Kuhn, and he would work with them on their stories to turn them into Star Trek teleplays. Kuhn was praised and respected for his honesty in dealing with people. People say that when they worked with Kuhn, he was always 100% respectful to everyone he worked with, and everyone around him. He never had any hidden agendas or secrets. Even in disagreements with the studio heads, Gene would accept the ultimatum they gave him and walk away respectfully. Even if the decision was in his favor or not, Gene would continue to work with the other party, respectfully and professionally. Many people that worked with Kuhn explained that his personality definitely reflected on his stories and his writing. A close friend to both Gene Roddenberry and Gene Kuhn once said that when you compare the two, Gene Kuhn was always 100% Gene Kuhn when you work with him. No hidden agendas, no secrets, a hard-working professional that was always respectful. And on the other hand, when you look at Gene Roddenberry, it was all an act. Gene Roddenberry was the great bird of the galaxy, and when people came to see him, that's what they wanted to see. So Gene had to be the great bird of the galaxy. But Roddenberry was extremely charismatic, and he would keep up this act to impress people. But that's all it was, just an act. Gene Kuhn was also a very progressive thinker. While working on Star Trek at Desilu Studios, a memorandum was put out to hire more African-American employees for the studio. Up until this point, the studio had been predominantly white. Among them was Andrea Richardson, a young African-American female that had worked under people like Malcolm X. Kuhn would see her day to day, get to know her personally, and then hire her as his secretary. Richardson decided to accept the offer. Though she admits at the time, with his last name being Kuhn, it didn't look good in her case having previously worked for people like Malcolm X. But she turned out to respect Kuhn more than almost anybody she knew. She firmly states that he was a thoughtful and wonderful human being. And she had worked with him on scripts, and he respected all her insights. 
She adds that some of the best times in her life were working for Jean Kuhn. She gives a small story about her time with Jean Kuhn, saying that she once took him to an African-American religious ceremony that barred white people from entering. Kuhn insisted on going because he was just naturally curious about the whole ceremony itself. She states, first and foremost, the one thing about Jean Kuhn is that he did not see color. He's seen people. And she adds that Jean Kuhn was one of the nicest, most honest, and respectful people that she has ever worked with. So, as the story goes, Jean L. Kuhn was in complete charge of Star Trek's production by the middle of season one. But troubles would start to arise for the series getting renewed for the second season. NBC just felt that the ratings weren't holding up to what they had hoped and planned to cancel the series altogether. This in turn triggered the first fan outrage and it led to a massive letter campaign by the fans to keep Star Trek on the air and renew it for a second season. Fans would begin to write thousands of letters and send them to the NBC station to beg them not to cancel the show. An NBC executive stated that in those days, mail was very important to them, and that on average, the station itself would receive over 50,000 pieces of mail a year. Also at the time, NBC had a policy in place that said they would respond to every piece of mail that was written and sent in. But this Star Trek campaign was unlike anything they'd ever had seen. Fans would send in over 1 million letters to the NBC studio. And many of these letters that were being sent in were from people with all different types of various backgrounds. Up until this point, NBC had thought that only children and young adults had watched Star Trek. They never suspected that adults would watch the show as well, and professors and engineers and scientists were all fans of the show. And with thousands of letters arriving day by day, NBC just had no clue how to respond. They had employees with shovels, shoveling all the mail together just to sort it out. Not knowing how to properly respond to a situation like this, NBC went live during primetime, saying that Star Trek would indeed be renewed for a second season. Going live during primetime with a message like this was usually held in reserve for things like the death of a president or an ongoing political or global crisis. But NBC felt it was the only proper way to respond to this letter campaign. So for all you folks out there that helped save the Expanse and later on, you know, help renew the Orville, this is where it all started, right here. And also not to mention that in this case, it was quite successful. But with the renewal of the second season, NBC would drastically cut Star Trek's budget. And with the actors' salaries going up in season two, as well as the rising production costs, this was a huge blow to Star Trek in terms of quality. After the second season renewal, Gene Kuhn would continue to produce the show and with great success. Roddenberry at the time was hired by MGM and sent to Italy to work out the teleplay for their movie Pretty Maids All in a Row. He would be in Italy for four weeks. During Roddenberry's absence, Gene Kuhn had turned the show around with its fans and critics. The show continued to gain momentum and its fan base grew rapidly. Also, Star Trek's characters were now becoming wildly popular. With fan mail continuing to come in by the thousands, Desilu Studios knew it finally had a success on its hands. But, as big as the success that Star Trek had become, Desilu Studios was still losing $15,000 per episode producing it. Producing Star Trek was costly, and enormously so. Back then, at $15,000 an episode, in today's terms, it would be $500,000 an episode that Desilu Studios was losing producing Star Trek. And at the time, Desilu Studios was also producing Mission Impossible, which incurred heavy production costs as well. Because of these two shows, Desilu Studios would eventually go bankrupt. So in the middle of Star Trek's second season, Lucille Ball was forced to sell Desilu Studios to Paramount. And this is where the story gets interesting. Now, people know that Lucille Ball had contributed to Star Trek. Some know that she helped greenlight the series. But what a lot of people don't know is the extent of her sacrifice in keeping Star Trek alive and running. Lucille Ball fought for Star Trek and to the bloody end. When Star Trek was first conceived by Gene Roddenberry, Lucille Ball took an immediate interest in it. At the time, Desi Lu Studios was owned by both Lucille Ball and her husband Desi Arnaz. But when they divorced, Desi Arnaz gave Lucille Ball the studio. As sole owner of Desi Lu Studios, Lucille Ball went against the words of her advisors and kept Star Trek running. Initially, all of her advisors had warned her not to produce Star Trek, 
they knew what kind of production costs a show like Star Trek could incur. While producing the show, her advisors knew months beforehand that this would eventually bankrupt the studio. All of her advisors urged her to stop. They warned her, but she still pressed on. At the time, she had fully believed that Star Trek would become one of the most rerun shows in all of syndication history. She had already accomplished this with I Love Lucy. She realized the full potential of what a show like Star Trek could achieve. So against the advice of everyone, including her advisors, she kept the show going, all the way to the very end. And at that time, it was hard just to go out and get a loan for several million dollars, especially if you were a woman. So. Lucille Ball was eventually forced to sell Desilu Studios to Paramount. On the day of selling the company, Lucille Ball would attend the ceremony and take pictures for the press. People say when you look at the photos, even though she's smiling in them, you can totally tell that she's being torn apart from the inside out. Studio meant everything to Lucy, and the reason why is because when her and Desi Arnaz got divorced, Lucy would become the sole owner of Desilu Studios. This, in turn, would make her the first woman to ever be head of a major studio in Hollywood and made her one of the most powerful women in Hollywood, period. And now it was all being torn away right in front of her eyes. And the sad thing is, if she had held out for just six more months, or if she had gotten that several million dollar loan, Lucille Ball's assumption about Star Trek was 100% correct. Because by the end of its sophomore season, Star Trek would indeed become the success that Lucille Ball had envisioned. And not only was she right about the show's upfront success, but she was right about the show's ability to do well in syndication. Because the two most watched shows in the history of syndicated television would turn out to be I Love Lucy and Star Trek. So please, consider taking a moment to acknowledge the amazing lady that believed in Star Trek from the start and give thanks for both her contribution and sacrifice to keep Star Trek alive and running. Honorary Admiral Lucille Ball, perhaps the first and most important Trekkie to ever exist. And now, back to the main story. During the time of the studio's bankruptcy, Roddenberry had returned from Italy. He then decided to make a surprise visit to the studio, and he walked in unannounced. Off in the distance, he heard the crew all laughing. He seen that the lights were on, so he knew they were filming, so Roddenberry went to investigate. They were filming a scene from the episode Trouble with Tribbles, where Kirk is under the hatch and all the Tribbles fall on him and everybody laughs at the end. Seeing this as pure comedy, Roddenberry was furious. Roddenberry immediately went to the post-production room and he asked to look at the previous episode, which was I'm Mud, an episode that he had personally signed off on. But instead of the way Roddenberry envisioned it, it turned out to be a comedy. The great bird of the galaxy finally felt that he had been crossed. He asked to look at the next episode of production, which was bread and circuses, but he had already had enough. Gene had felt the comedy was destroying his show. Roddenberry then went to confront Kuhn, and they had an argument about the comedy in Star Trek. Kuhn replied, but that's what he was hired to do, was to make the characters more real, and comedy was a part of that and it worked. The argument continued on, and things began to heat up, and then Gene Alcoon put his pencil down on the table and walked out the door. He was exhausted. He had enough, and he didn't want to fight with Roddenberry. And even after this argument with Roddenberry and their falling out, and even after leaving his duties as a producer on the show, Gene Kuhn would still contribute and work on the show, but he would do so under the name Lee Cronin. He would also continue to work with Gene Roddenberry from time to time. And on a side note, under the name Lee Cronin, Gene Kuhn wrote Spock's Brain, which is considered one of the worst episodes of Star Trek ever made. People speculate that he wrote Spock's Brain out of sheer spite because of the falling out he had with Roddenberry. But still, many discredit this theory because of the type of man Gene Kuhn was. But nonetheless, Roddenberry still gets all the credit. because. He was the boss. Now don't get me wrong, I do not doubt Gene Roddenberry's vision for Star Trek. He is the man that started it. He is the one that got the ball rolling. While Gene Roddenberry was alive, he heavily influenced Star Trek, even though in a very egotistical sense, as you're about to see. What people fail to realize, though, is that Gene Roddenberry was the boss. He was the commander. 
Yet, there are many instances where Gene Roddenberry wasn't even running the show, but he was there as a, a consultant in a like an advisory capacity. But, in my honest opinion, the two major factors that Gene Roddenberry contributed to Star Trek were A. He was a highly charismatic person, especially if you were on his side. Many people say that if Gene Roddenberry wanted you to like him, he would make it almost impossible for you not to. Others say that Roddenberry could tell you to go to hell in such a way that it would make you want to ask directions from him. And B, Gene was a great, a great, a phenomenal scout for talent. He was amazing at going out and grabbing the people he needed to craft his vision. Phenomenal. If anything, Roddenberry is one of the most amazing staffers in the history of television. As I stated in this video earlier, all the people that were a part of Gene Roddenberry's camp stayed very loyal to Gene Roddenberry, even past his death. But like I said, in my opinion, those are the two main factors that Roddenberry, I feel, brought to Star Trek. But damned if Gene Roddenberry doesn't get most of the credit for the original series himself. But simply put, this is just not the case. Thousands of people have dedicated their lives at some point to work on Star Trek and make it the beautiful universe it is. There are many more heroes in Star Trek than what we see on the screen. Some of these people that made and produced this show, especially the ones in the 60s, are mind-blowing. They didn't have nothing to work with. They created, out of thin air, all the special effects that we see and take for granted now. Look. Gene Roddenberry might have been responsible for creating this franchise, and he's responsible for creating some of the characters like Picard and Kirk, and he's responsible for starting the show and getting the ball rolling. But, but, it was Gene Alcoon's writing in the 60s that laid the very foundation of the Star Trek we see today. The UFP, the Prime Directive, uh, that was all Gene Alcoon, and he just does not get enough credit for it. Roddenberry, flamboyantly, does take most of the credit for Star Trek. So please, do yourself a favor, when you do have the time, look into Gene Alcoon and see what he contributed to Star Trek, because the man is really a hero, and he should be noticed. So, enough about Gene Alcoon, now back to the story. When Gene Alcoon left Star Trek in the middle of its second season, many of the critics at the time hailed this as a huge turning point in the show's overall production and quality. Many people had loved the world that Gene Kuhn had shaped for Star Trek. So with now Kuhn gone from the Star Trek universe, Gene Roddenberry went back to all those scripts that he had wrote and started removing the humor from them. His aim was to return the show to a more military and professional environment. He was trying to return the show to its roots. His roots. After Roddenberry had rewrote the scripts for the last half of season two, he had brought aboard a producer by the name of John Meredith Lucas to finish out the season. Lucas would ultimately comply with Roddenberry's request and his vision to make the show a more professional and military environment. In his own words, he would play it safe and comply with Roddenberry's requests and finish out the last half of season two. After season two though, John Meredith Lucas would leave Star Trek. He would, however, continue as a writer for Star Trek and write two episodes in the third season. Many people claim that you could see the decline in quality of the show under John Meredith Lucas, both visually and conceptually. The critics agree that the show thrived under Gene Alcoon and that John Meredith Lucas just didn't bring anything to the table. Another problem that plagued the show in its second season was the infighting between the actors. Leonard Nimoy Spock, who was just supposed to be a support character on the show, was now outpacing William Shatner's Kirk in popularity. In this era of television and in Hollywood, the only two key factors that determine your success were pretty much the critics and your fan mail. Now, Hollywood critics are gonna say what they're gonna say about you. They're gonna like you or not. But fan mail spoke volumes. If one actor had more fan mail than another, that was a big deal. As Especially in a time with no Twitter or Facebook or any type of social media to get the word out. Um, word was pretty much word of mouth and what people said about you in the paper. If they liked your performance, they liked your performance. Yeah, you get a little credit there, but like I said, fan mail spoke volumes. So when Nimoy started receiving more fan mail than Shatner, 
a small rivalry broke out between the actors. Because the actors were popular now and they felt that they had worth, they started interjecting their opinions to the directors that their character would do this or their character wouldn't do that. They started stealing each other's lines. They started stealing each other's scenes, camera time. Uh, a lot of petty arguments broke out and it didn't just end with Nimoy and Shatner. Other actors started getting involved. DeForest Kelly, George Takai, everybody started getting into these petty squabbling arguments. And this ultimately led Gene Roddenberry to step in and take action. Gene Roddenberry put out a memorandum to everybody in the crew. He got all the actors together and he basically put it to them that they should be grateful for working on the show and there should be no petty squabbling and not to step on anybody's toes, be respectful. And for the most part, this really did satisfy the argument and it really did bring it to a close. There were still arguments here and there, but after this note that Roddenberry had passed down to everybody, it was considerably less. And as it was with season one, season two was also in trouble of being canceled. During Paramount's acquisition of Desilu Studios, Paramount was more interested in the land it sat on than the studio itself. They took the production lots and put them to use. They didn't really care about the shows that came attached with it. But at the time, NBC and Paramount had no intention of continuing with Star Trek. In fact, they tried to kill it. But, as fate would have it, the fans struck again. Another huge and successful campaign was launched by the fans, who were now worldwide, to keep Star Trek on the air. Professors of universities wrote in, school teachers, scientists, many people lended their voice in renewing Star Trek for a season three. Many fans started many little campaigns of their own all over the country. Their motto was to tell one person to write into NBC, and then that person to tell 10 people, and those 10 people to tell 10 people. And back in the day, this is pretty much how word of mouth was done. This is how it got accomplished, and it was successful. But as dumbfounded as they were the first time around, NBC was dumbfounded again. They had no clue that this many people liked Star Trek or were even into it. It was around then that NBC started taking it seriously and started putting money into finding out why people love this show. They would eventually hire out to another company to do studies for Star Trek and all different demographics and see where it's successful and where it's not. But ultimately, the fans had won and Star Trek would be renewed for its third season and be eligible for syndication. But like the last time around, NBC would have stipulations for Star Trek's renewal NBC's first stipulation would be to take Gene Roddenberry out of direct control of the show. He would act as an executive consultant on the show, ultimately hiring another producer to produce season three. NBC's second stipulation would be that they would slash the budget on the show again, and this would lead to disastrous consequences for the third season. The third season didn't have money to do nothing. People that worked on the third season said they did miracles, miracles with the money they were given to produce Star Trek. And then the final stipulation, and perhaps the biggest F you to the series, and the final nail in the coffin, was the scheduling of Star Trek in a death slot. Instead of its normal primetime viewing, Star Trek would not be scheduled for Friday night at 10 o'clock, and this is what they considered the death slot. The reason why it's called the death slot is because no one's up to watch TV at that moment. The kids are in bed, and the adults around 10 o'clock are usually out of the house, at the bar or whatnot, or, you know, mom's in bed with the kids but that's why they called this slot the death slot. If the show was in the threat of being canceled and it was on the chopping block, or if they just didn't want to financially produce the show anymore, this is the slot of television that the show would go to. So now, with season three getting the green light, Gene Roddenberry would indeed step back as executive consultant, and then he would go out and hire someone to produce the show. So Gene Roddenberry would set his sights on veteran producer Fred Freeberger, who would eventually would produce Star Trek's third season. Fred Freeberger was well respected at the time, and many felt that Star Trek was in good hands. But due to the severe budget constraints put onto them by the studio, it really didn't give him much to work with. Freeberger would ultimately produce all of season three, and Gene would help from time to time with scripts here and there, but Gene pretty much did stay as just an executive consultant. Needless to say, the reviews from season three were not stellar, and many fans considered it a complete step down from season two. But after a lackluster third season that failed to meet expectations, NBC and Paramount got their wish. They had finally killed Star Trek. 
and unfortunately this time, there would be no fan movement to bring it back. It did, however, go to syndication because it got a third season. And this is where NBC and Paramount didn't expect Star Trek to take off. So, for the next four years, Star Trek itself would lie in syndication and reruns. But that didn't stop the show from growing. After the completion of the original series, Gene himself would go heavy into merchandising Star Trek around the country. Roddenberry would continue to go to conventions and still promote the show. That is, until 1973, when Star Trek would make a triumphant return, but not in the live action series, but its animated series. Which I will cover in part two of this video, detailing the time from the animated series up into Gene's death in the fifth season of TNG. So until then, I hope you did enjoy this little backstory into the history of Star Trek. And please, if you like my video and you like what I do, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more content. Don't forget to hit the like button and leave a comment below or any suggestions you might have for me. And if you feel I got anything wrong in this video, please, please point it out to me. I make mistakes and I am an Ensign after all. And until my next episode of Understanding Trek, my name is Ensign Ricky, your resident YouTube redshirt. This is the Lower Decks, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Peace.